Now, John M. Lundquist, in his book published by Thames and Hudson back in 1993, The Temple, The Meeting Place of Heaven and Earth, notes some very interesting things about the idea of the temple with water and the fascinating aspects of how water has a dual image notion that I want to share with you in relation to the temple of God and the mountain of God. He notes, he notes that in the beginning there was water. This was the beginning element. And it has two different phases. A beneficial phase and a destructive idea, a destructive imagery. These two aspects go hand in hand with the theme of mountains and temples. Temples can have a destructive aspect. You remember the Ark of the Covenant in the ancient Israelite wars with the Philistines. Also, the temple is the giver of life. In the Babylonian creation account in the Enuma Elish, the battle over chaos was won by forces of the cosmos. And in the case of the Enuma Elish, this was Marduk who defeated the chaotic waters and their serpent deity. In Enuma Elish, that serpent deity was Tiamat. The Tihom of the Hebrew Bible is a correlation there. With the end of the conflict, this is when the waters subsided and there appeared a mound of earth, the primordial mound, the original mountain, the original temple of God. So it's this archetype of the mound, the temple, the first appearance of the first land. This is why mountains are associated with temples, and temples are artificial mountains. This is the theme of the idea of the temple of God being the mountains. It's a beautiful theme. It's a very interesting theme how it connects back and forth with heaven, earth, humankind, and deity, where deity can go reside on this mound of earth. It's charged with the energy of primordial life. It becomes transformed into the sacred mountain, is this theme of the primordial mound. And of course, this was in Egypt, the famous step pyramid. This primordial mountain, this was the most holy sacred spot on earth, is how the ancients de depicted these. They said the primordial hill was modified into the pyramids in the ancient Egyptian pantheon and constructs. The same conceptions are found in ancient Judaism with this idea of the primordial mound and the sacred waters and the trees of life. This is the idea of the foundation stone of the temple, is this holy of holies, with the temple as the center of the world, the most holy spot. This is the spot of the foundation of the world. This is the theme that is so fascinatingly depicted in ancient Judaism with the Solomon Temple and with temples in general, as well as other ancient societies. This is the primordial stone that Jacob slept on when he used the stone as a pillow for his head when he saw the ladder and the angels ascending and descending out of the heavens down to the earth. It was in ancient Israel that this foundation stone played the same role as the primordial mound played in the ancient Egyptian creation themes. It was the first solid material to emerge from the waters of creation. And it was upon this stone that the deity affected creation. Lundquist says this on page 7 of his fabulous study on the temple. He says, according to Jewish legend, it was the primordial rock on which Jacob at the plain named Beit El, the house of God. The Hebrew combination Beit is house, and El, of course, is the original deity. The same rock then came to place of the Holy of Holies in the temple, which is interesting. And this is in the temple of Solomon. In Islamic tradition, it is this same rock from which the prophet Muhammad ascended into heaven. It's also the most, the second most sacred mosque of Islam, the Dome of the Rock, that is in existence to this day. 
So these themes, these themes of the mountains, of the domes, of the rock, the foundation stone, the place where deity connects with humanity. This is a very important theme in the ancient world. There's the Dur Anki. There is the place where God resides in the mountains. Is it any wonder we all love to commune with nature in the mountains? These are the original temples of the deities. Without question, these mountains are some of the most magnificent places where we can commune with deity. The theme in ancient Sumer is that the inmost sanctuary was sometimes referred to as the Holy Mound. And this is the mound that rose out of the primordial abyss. Perhaps no culture has so thoroughly equated and created the architectural equivalent of a mountain in the temples as the Khmers of Cambodia with their magnificent temples and their mountains. And the carvings on those mountains, those temples, tell stories of the creation, of the destruction of chaos, and of the coming forth of life from deity. This all happened in the mountains. It's very interesting how he puts all that together. And there's, of course, Mount Meru, Mount Mandara, and Kailasa in the Indian traditions of the mountains, of the world mountains. And, of course, these mountains, along with the basic archetype of mountain in general, is this is the axis of the universe. And that's why when we align ourselves with these axes, when we go up into these mountains... We feel a connection to the cosmos. This is no accident. This is how the theme works from our perspective. It is the axis upon which the universe rotates. So, of course, it has all of the focus of the energy, the light, the water, and the life on this axis. And that's why it's such a sacred spot. It's a fascinating theme, isn't it? It's absolutely beautiful. And, of course, the waters of life. He discusses the idea of the mountain being a powerful earthly center and a point of contact with the heavens. It's a gathering place, of course, for all the seasonal rituals of the various peoples and their, their religious outlooks. They're connecting with the cosmos. They're connecting with the gods in the heavens. The gateways depict the procession of the kings and the nobles. And, of course, everyone brings fabulous gifts for each other, so on and so forth. I mean, it's, it's just non-ending. It's absolutely everywhere in the ancient world. We have the uh, ancient Jewish festivals in just this area. The, the theme is Mount Saphon in the north is the dwelling place of the deity El in the Canaanite pantheon. And Michael Heiser's doctoral dissertation discusses that, quite frankly. And we have Mount Zion, Mount Gerevim. There's all kinds of sacred mountains all over the world. One of the main purposes of the New Year festivals, now this is the Jewish New Year's festivals, which the Book of Mormon could be reflecting powerfully in King Benjamin's speech. He gathered the people together, and he built a tower, a high mound, so that he could talk to the people. This idea, of course, is to reestablish and reaffirm the people's connections with the gods, with the creation, and with the earth, and with each other. This is where the covenants were made between men and gods. It's, it's a very fascinating thing. The Dur Anki, the bond, which is the meaning of covenant, between gods and men, heaven and earth. They are separate, and yet they are connected. They are connected through the mountains, through the temples. The vegetation that the waters produce, of course, the waters of life, we equate with the tree of life. He's saying this on page 8. It was luxurious, pristine, and life-giving. This symbolism is exceptionally vivid in the Old Testament in reference to the Messianic temple of the end of time that Ezekiel talked about so much. This Messiah figure was to die on the tree of life, the cross, so that he could bring back eternal life. He gets rid of the mortal life 
and he deifies all people and gives them immortality. That is the concept, that's the definition of being a god, is being deathless.